Good morning, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Welcome to this week's study. As we return to where we left off on Thursday, as we consider these final verses of Daniel 11 and the commentary provided by Uriah Smith, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and un look to understand more clearly the implications of how these verses are impacting what we have come to believe at this time. Shall we now place this before the Lord in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come together together today to study, to look, to understand what you would have us to know. There are many points that we need to be able to fix in our minds. We ask, Father, for your guidance and your direction. We thank you for all that you have provided we thank you for allowing us time to consider these things so that we may be better prepared for that which is to come. May your angels attend us. May your spirit direct our minds in the paths that you would have us to walk. Help us now be with us so that in all things we may do that which most glorifies you. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we left off with this paragraph. Egypt shall not escape, are the words of the prophecy. That's Daniel 11.42. This language would imply that Egypt would be brought in subjection to some power from whose dominion it would desire to be released. As between the French and the Turks, how did this question stand with the Egyptians? They preferred French rule. In R. R. Madden's travels in Egypt, Nubia, Turkey, and Palestine in the years 1824 to 27, published in London in 1829, it is stated that the French were much regretted by the Egyptians and extolled as benefactors, that for the short period they remained, they left traces of amelioration, and that if they could have established their power, Egypt would now be completely civilized. In view of this testimony, the language would not be appropriate if applied to the French, for the Egyptians did not desire to escape out of their hands. They did desire to escape from the hands of the Turks, but could not. Now, did we have any further comment on this, on this particular paragraph with Smith's literal application herein? Well, we just said sort of that he's picking and choosing things. Agreed. Now, verse 43. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and all of the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Smith refers to the following. In illustration of this verse, we quote the following from the historic echoes of the voice of God. Page 49. History gives the following facts. The French were driven out of Egypt and the Turks took possession. The Sultan permitted the Egyptians to reorganize their government as it was before the French invasion. He asked of the Egyptians neither soldiers, guns, nor fortifications, but left them to manage their own affairs independently. And with the important exception of putting the nation under tribute to himself, in the Articles of Agreement between the Sultan and the Pasha of Egypt, it was stipulated that the Egyptians should pay annually to the Turkish government a certain amount of gold and silver and 600,000 measures of corn and 400,000 measures of barley. The Libyans and the Ethiopians, the Kushim, says Dr. Clark, the unconquered Arabs, have sought the friendship of the Turks and many of whom are tributary to them to the present time. So, again, Smith is picking things that are going to support his position for this to be literal rather than figurative. Yeah. Now, I did some research on um, Alexander Keith and what he says about this. And, yeah. and he's going to have the king of the north being Turkey. And the really it just becomes about Islam, right? So we got so we got uh, 
Turkey in there, which is going to be uh, connected to Islam, right? And that's going to be the power then that's going to do all these things that we attribute to the Sunday law um, in Daniel chapter 11. They're going to be attributing it to Islam. That makes sense? Okay. That's, that, that's sort of the view. You hear that view. Now you have some other people who have the king of the south being Islam, which I still have a hard time understanding how they do that. I don't um, see that. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so the question is, do we take this language of the overflowing in the Passover you know, if we if we were to follow Miller's rules and we were going to compare these overflowing, we know that it represents the Sunday law, right? We've shown that many times, and um, yet here this is going to be addressing Islam, nothing to do with the Sunday law. So there, so there's lots of problems with this. Now, um, I also did talk to. Well, chatted on Messenger with David H. Thiel. So he's he's the guy who wrote this paper that's an amazing discoveries has, um, which is a critique of Lewis F. Weir's objections to the Eastern question, and which I think that we should actually go through in our studies because I think um, understanding Lewis F. Weir in more detail. And comparing what people are saying about Louis F. Weir and his understanding. And also the whole issue of the Eastern question. Because the Eastern question then obviously deals with the Ottoman Empire, which deals with Islam. And so we have um, modern interpretations of Uriah Smith's understanding here. That, you know, everybody's trying to fit Islam into Daniel chapter 11, one way or the other whether they have him as the king of the north or the king of the south. And, you know, and you could argue, you know, Islam has control of Egypt as well as Syria. I mean, Islam conquers that whole territory at some point, right? Correct. So does does Islam become the king of the north and the king of the south? I don't see that it's ever the king of the north. Right, right. or, Or the king of the south, right? Because the literal territory can't be what determines the king of the north and the king of the south at the end of the world. Would you like to go through Weir's paper now? Uh, well, Weir's paper, you mean uh, Fields' paper? Okay. No, it's once we're done this, once we're done Uriah Smith, then we will go through Fields' paper. All right. Right? Just, I'm just saying that that we need to understand this thoroughly. We need to know what Lewis F. Weir says, what the criticisms are, um, Edwin Thiel, or not Edwin Thiel, David Thiel, uh, not related to Edwin Thiel. He, he he takes the position that Alan White's endorsement of Smith's book on Daniel and Revelation is is basically he doesn't say it this way, but basically it's inspired. It's without fault, you know, that we need to accept everything that Uriah Smith says in that book because Alan White endorses it. And, you know, my contention is, well, she endorses the Daystar article, the extra, uh, by Crozier, which has errors in it. She endorses the Midnight Cry, the true Midnight Cry of Samuel Snow, which has errors in it. And there's many people who will try to say, well, Ellen White endorses Samuel Snow's Midnight Cry, so we have to accept everything in there, even when it contradicts the direct statements in the spirit of prophecy. And, and the same with the Daystar article. We have to accept it, even when it contradicts plain statements in the spirit of prophecy. So her endorsement of Uriah Smith's thoughts on Daniel as God's helping hand isn't, isn't saying it's without fault. You know, I can recommend a book to a person, you know, really good book to read. Does it mean I agree with everything in the book? You know, obviously not. I don't know of any book that agrees with everything, I think. Right. So, you know, there's always differences. And Alan White's looking at the overall general intent of Daniel and Revelation. It's definitely very helpful if you're wanting to understand the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, especially in that time. 
right? What they needed to understand in that time. But as we move to the end of the world, we, we find that there are things that obviously uh, Smith gets wrong and he gets wrong because partly because of the time in which he's writing. That is, he couldn't have got those things correct unless, you know, he had been given divine inspiration, which he isn't because he, he couldn't see our time. So, but that's, that's the problem we're having here with, with Smith is he's, he's living in his time, looking at things from his perspective. And he is basically re reiterating Josiah Litch's views. Now, Josiah Litch's views do differ, differ from Alexander Keith's in some areas. So, um, but, but def definitely Alexander Keith is a source uh, that uh, Josiah Litch has. Because Keith's book, I think, was written in 1823. So it would be a book that he had access to. And so some oh. views in Keith's book. Are, are are used by by Lich and Keith uh, focuses a lot also on one of the reasons we know Josiah Lich uses Alexander Keith is the and, and I, Alexander Keith is actually quite a good uh, um, commentator. Uh, I mean, he gets lots of things right, but his focus on Revelation nine, for instance, um, is very very similar to Josiah Lich's. Obviously, he doesn't give a a date for the start of 150 years and the 391 and a years and 15 days he doesn't he doesn't do that detail, uh, but he sees Islam a lot in in history, both in Revelation nine and also in Revelation chapter eleven, uh, uh, verse forty to forty five. Right, so uh, Islam is is really the main focus, not so much about France, though France is going to be that power that, that Turkey and Egypt are going to come against. So, I mean, it's kind of interesting as we work further in detail into these problems. And, and I think we really need to sort it out um, more completely so we have a complete understanding of that. Now, of course, that's my natural uh, tendency is to want to dig into these really deep details, but I think it is helpful. So since Smith was reiterating some of what Litch had to say, is he divergent from Litch's position? Is he divergent from Keith's position? Does he come to his own position that is separate from the other two? Well, his his position is basically Josiah Lich's position. The only difference is that he's lit, he's writing some years after, and he's trying to take what he sees in the headlines of to, of the day and uh, applying them. Right. So so he's looking at contemporary events and making predictions about what he believes is going to happen. Now. Some of that is removed from later editions of Thoughts on Daniel. Um, but it, it's definitely, uh, when we look here, I mean, we haven't got to exactly, you know, to verse 45 yet. But uh, I think here in verse 44, we're going to start to see what he's going to say. I haven't looked at it yet because I don't have your... Uh, well, I have your paper, but I haven't looked at it. I've just looked at what I have on my computer, which is later edition of Daniel and Revelation. Okay? So, so. The, the point then for what you're stating, mm -hmm. since Smith is writing this in the, in the time frame of 1870 to 1871, mm -hmm. He's writing it subsequent to Mrs. White's admonition that time shall be no more after 1844. So in a manner of speaking, he is denying the spirit of prophecy by attempting to make predictions 
No, he's not making time predictions. He's just describing what events are going to follow. Mm. So I wouldn't I wouldn't say he's making time predictions, but of what he how he sees that it's going to unfold. Okay. So, <clears throat> verse forty four. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. On this verse also, Dr. Clark has a note, which is worthy of mention. He says, this part of the prophecy is allowed to be yet unfulfilled. This was printed in 1825. In another portion, his note, he says, If the Turkish power be understood, as in the preceding verses, it may mean that the Persians on the east and the Russians on the north will at some time greatly embarrass the Ottoman government. Between this conjecture of Dr. Clark's and the late Crimean War, there is certainly a striking coincidence, inasmuch as the very powers he mentions, the Persians on the east and the Russians on the north, were the ones which instigated that conflict. Tidings from these powers troubled him. Their attitude and movements incited the sultan to anger and revenge. Russia, being the more aggressive party, was the object of attack. Turkey declared war on her powerful northern neighbor in 1853. The world looked on in amazement to see a government which had so long been called the sick man of the East, a government whose army was dispirited and demoralized, whose treasuries were empty, whose rulers were vile and imbecile, and whose subjects were rebellious and threatening secession, rush with such impetuosity into the conflict. The prophecy said they should go forth with great fury. And when they thus went forth, the profane vernacular of an American writer described them as fighting like devils. England and France, it is true, soon came to the help of Turkey, but she went forth in the manner described, and as is reported, gained victory after victory before receiving the assistance of these powers. Right. So here we have um, this, the Crimean War, as being a fulfillment of this. Now, in in the book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation that I have on my eSort, it doesn't have this. Okay. Um, at least not all the detail. It does have this. I guess it has part of these. I guess actually it does have this. Come to think of it. Yeah, it does have this. Um, so I'm not sure if this was taken out of later editions because I think this is actually an early edition of the book. It's a little bit different. Right, because I'm because we're looking at the the Review and Herald articles here, and I'm looking at uh, the book. Do you know what year the book that you're looking at? Yeah, let me just check here. Uh, no, it doesn't say. Okay, because I believe I have the 1882 edition, and I know that there's a 1945 edition. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is an earlier edition. This isn't like the later edition. But I, but I think some of this stuff was taken out in the later editions. But, you know, I haven't sat down and compared every place. I know that there's a lot taken out of the later editions of, of Daniel and Revelation. Yeah, so this is similar what's in here, what's on your page, is similar to what's in the book that I have. But so anyway, he's seen this in connection with the Crimean War. Now, uh, Adam Clark wrote in 1825, the Crimean War was in 1853 to 1856. So he's saying because he was able to sort of predict um, this, because the prophecy is not yet fulfilled. So he's saying that Adam Clark is basically predicted correctly what occurred okay so that's what what he's trying to say here there's a striking coincidence between the korean war and that's the view that david thiel takes is that this is you know this is correct this sort of verifies that you know this understanding of 
the Crimean War is being fulfilled by these verses. Okay, so so we'll have to look at that in more detail. Okay, now comment from the chat. Do you think Jeremiah 40, verse 12? Okay, do you, I'm, I'm going to read the chat exactly. Do you think ver, Jeremiah 40, verse 12, verse 12, are tied to Daniel eleven forty one? Because Edom, Moab, and Ammon's remnant Jews who would be who would parallel last day Christians are mentioned there, who return to Judah or practice their faith and gather many provisions, are blessed even though they were under a governor appointed by the Babylonian king or the papacy still rules. I don't really know how to answer this question. First are you referring to verses 12 and 13 of Jeremiah 40? And why are you tying this to Jewish people being in Edom, Moab, and Ammon, and not directly just to the Edomites, Moabites, and Ammonites? Okay. okay Jeremiah 40, verse 11 and 12. So that's likewise when all the Jews that were in Moab among the Ammonites and in Edom and that were in all the countries heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant of Judah and that he had set over them Gedaliah, the son of An Ahikam, the son of Shaphan. Even all the Jews returned out of all places whither they were driven and came to the land of Judah to Gedaliah unto Mizpah and gathered wine and summer fruits very much. So Angela's referring to those verses. I don't know if I would connect them necessarily, but I mean, we got Edom, Moab, and Ammon mentioned. So it just means that at that time, after uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and the death of Zedekiah, Gedaliah was set up as governor and people returned to uh, Jerusalem at that time to Judah, to the land of Judah. So, I mean, maybe there's some typical significance there, but I'm not sure. Okay. Verse 45. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now, Smith continues. We have now traced the prophecy of the 11th of Daniel down step by step and have thus far found events to fulfill all its predictions. It has been wrought out unto history except this last verse. The predictions of the preceding verse having been fulfilled within the memory of the generation now living, we are carried by this one past our own day into the future. For no power has yet performed the acts here described. But it is to be fulfilled. And its fulfillment must be accomplished by that power which has been the subject of the prophecy from the 40th verse. If the application to which we have given the preference in passing over these verses is correct, we must look to Turkey to make the move here indicated. Now, I would disagree with Smith. I don't see that Turkey has anything to do with this, yet he is insistent that that's the direction that this should take. Any other thoughts? Well, so... Uh, um, David Thiel says that because uh, Louis F. Weir's feelings were hurt by how he was treated by the church, I'm not sure how he knows all of this, um, that, and that Uriah Smith's prediction had failed, that he comes up with this new interpretation, this new hermeneutic to interpret these verses. And, and then he's going to come up with this view that that Smith was wrong. I'm not sure what his hurt feelings regarding the church would have to do with his rejection of Uriah Smith and his acceptance of James White's understanding of Daniel 11, verse 36 and onward. But um, that's basically the argument is that he had these hurt feelings. And so since Uriah Smith's prediction was wrong, Turkey's now really not a part of, part of Bible prophecy that, you know, we're going to ignore that Smith's interpretation and we're going to come up with this new interpretation that this has to do with the king of the north being the papacy and the Sunday law and so forth. 
But we can see that obviously Turkey's not going to have a part to play in Bible prophecy. Now, what some people do is they try to take this, what happened with Uriah Smith's interpretation, and they apply it to the start of the First World War. Okay. Right. So that's how they see it as fulfilled. I'm not sure what, I haven't gone through everything Thiel has written on this, um, David Thiel. So, yeah, it's, um, I mean, this, if we were to take Uriah Smith's interpretation, I mean, obviously it would turn everything that we believe in this movement on its head. It would, it would discredit this movement. But that's not the reason why we reject what Uriah Smith says. Because I studied this back in the 1980s and um, definitely did not agree with Smith. So not that I understood much back then, but definitely, you know, we have another, if we're going to use that word, coincidence of fulfillments. Obviously, uh, Louis F. Weir's understanding is fulfilled in 1989. He predicts what's going to happen. So. We could say, well, was um, Adam Clark, you know, his prediction regarding basically what happened in the C Crimean War, did that have to do with Bible prophecy? And what does that have to do with the close of probation and the end of the world? It doesn't really seem to have much to do with it. But Uriah Smith seems to think that it did, that it was a fulfillment. So now he's going to make some predictions, I guess, regarding how what place Turkey has in end time events. Okay. Smith continues. And let it be noted how readily this could be done. Palestine, which contains the glorious holy mountain, the mountain on which Jerusalem stands, between the seas, the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean, is a Turkish province. And if the Turk should be obliged to retire hastily from Europe, he could easily go to any point within his own dominions to establish his temporary headquarters, here appropriately described as the tabernacle's movable dwellings of his palace. But he could not go beyond them. The most notable point within the limit of Turkey in Asia is Jerusalem. The mark also how applicable the language to that power. He shall come to the end and none shall help him. This plainly implies that his this power has previously received help. And what are the facts? In the war against France in 1798 to 1801, and in the Crimean, in the Crimean. And in the Crimean War in 1853 to 56, the assistance of other powers, without which she probably would have failed to accomplish her object. And it is a notorious fact that since the fall of the Ottoman supremacy in 1840, that empire has existed through the sufferance of other powers. Without their pledged support, she would not be long able to maintain even a nominal existence. And when that is withdrawn, she must come to, gr to the ground. So the prophecy says that the king comes to his end and none help him. And he comes to his end, as we may naturally infer, because none help him. Because the support previously rendered is withdrawn. Any comments or thoughts? He's just taking this literally. And exactly. He ain't, he ain't taking it spiritually. No, he his, his entire premise on this in Daniel 11, is that the whole chapter is a literal prophecy. He sees no spiritual application. Kind of surprising, isn't it? Have we any indications that this part of the prophecy is soon to be fulfilled? As we raise the inquiry, we look not to the dim and distant ages in the past, whose events so long ago transpired now interest only the few but to the present living, moving world. Are the nations which are now on the stage of action with their disciplined armies and their multiplied weapons of war making any movements looking to this end? 
all eyes are now turned with interest toward Turkey. And the unanimous opinion of statesmen is that the Turk is destined soon to be driven from Europe. About two years since, a correspondent of the New York Tribune, writing from the East, said, Russia is arming to the teeth to be avenged on Turkey. Two campaigns of the Russian army will drive the Turks out of Europe. Carlton, a correspondent of the Boston Journal, writing from Paris under the head of the Eastern Question, said, The theme of conversation during this last week has not been concerning the exposition, but the Eastern Question. To what will it grow? Will there be war? What is Russia going to do? What position are the Western powers going to take? These are the questions discussed not only in the cafes and restaurants, but in the core legislative. Perhaps I cannot render better service at the present time than to group together some facts in regard to this question, which, according to present indications, is to engage the immediate attention of the world. What is the Eastern question? It is not easy to give a definition. For to Russia, it may mean one thing, to France another, and to Austria still another. But sifted to every side issue, it may be reduced to this, the driving of the Turk into Asia and a scramble for his territory. Again, he, Carlton, says, surely the indications that are that the Sultan is destined soon to see the western border of his dominions break off piece by piece. But what will follow? Are Romania, Serbia, Bosnia, Albania to be set up as an independent sovereignty together and to take position among the nations, or is there to be a grand rush for the estate of the Ottoman? But that is of the future, a future not far distant. Now, obviously, Carlton, whoever he was, was someone that Smith found great agreement with. Do we have any thoughts on what's just been presented? I mean, obviously, if we're dealing with end time prophecy, this would be irrelevant. And the question is, why would Daniel 11 focus upon what's happening to a failing Ottoman Empire? Right. And not address the papacy in Rome, which is the subject of all the other prophecies. I mean, this would have no connection with Daniel 12, verse 1, which Daniel 11 is leading us to that, right? I mean, it's a continuation of the same prophecy. So I, I guess the problem that I would have with Smith, among other things, is he doesn't seem to understand the purpose of the prophecy, Right. He, again, is just taking God's describing all of this history. But it seems biblically irrelevant, especially when we're addressing Jerusalem, literal Jerusalem at the end of the world. Why would we be addressing literal Jerusalem? Why would, you know, uh, the glorious land be Jerusalem and not the United States? Why would the glorious holy mountain be Mount Zion and not the church? Why would the king of the north be the, the nation that, that inhabits that territory of, you know, the, 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 the parts of the, that we call the north of the Greek empire and not be uh, the man of sin? It, it just doesn't really make any sense. Now, there is, you know, um, Uriah Smith is going to speak on the Eastern question many, many times because um, this is 1871. And he's going to still be presenting this issue uh, for years to come after he wrote these articles. And Alan White's going to talk out about, you know, Uriah Smith presenting on the Eastern question and that there was lost lots of interest. People are going to take that as that means Ellen White endorsed his understanding of the Eastern question. So there's a lot of issues involved. Like, how do we take Ellen White's endorsement of something? And how do we, how do we sort of distinguish when she's 
endorsing something and seeing it as correct or when she's just uh, endorsing something because there are some aspects that are useful. Uh, it does become a problem. Agreed. Now, Smith continues here. Since the date of the foregoing extracts, an astonishing revolution has taken place in Europe. France, one of the parties, if not the chief one, in the alliance to uphold the Ottoman throne, has been crushed, crushed by Prussia. Prussia, another party, is too much in sympathy with Russia to interfere with her movements against the Turk. England, in a third, in an embarrassed condition financially, cannot think of entering into any contest in behalf of Turkey without the alliance of France. Austria has not recovered from the blows she received in her late war with Prussia, and Italy is busy with the matter of stripping the Pope of his temporal power and making Rome the capital of the nation. A writer in the New York Tribune lately said that if Turkey should become involved in difficulty with Russia, she could count on the prompt assistance of Austria, France, and England. But we see that neither these powers nor any others who would be likely to assist Turkey are in any condition to do so at the present time, owing principally to the sudden and unexpected humiliation of the French nation. Russia now sees that her opportunity has come. She has accordingly startled all the powers of Europe last fall by stepping forth and deliberately announcing that she designed to regard no longer the stipulations of the Treaty of 1856. <clears throat> this treaty, concluded at the termination of the Crimean War, restricted the warlike operations of Russia in the Black Sea. But Russia must have this privilege if she would carry out her designs against Turkey. Hence, her determination to disregard that treaty right at this time when none of the powers are in a condition to enforce it. The ostensible reason urged by Russia is that she may have a seafront and harbors in a warmer climate <clears throat> than the shores of the Baltic. But the real design is against Turkey. Thus, the churchman of Hartford, Connecticut, in an able article to present on, on the present European medley, states that Russia, in her encroachments upon Turkey, is not merely seeking a sea frontier and harbors lying on the great highways of commerce, unclosed by Arctic winters, but that with a feeling akin to that which inspired the Crusades, she is actuated by an intense desire to drive the crescent from the soil of Europe. When Russia announced her intention to disregard the treaty, <clears throat> the other powers, though incapable of doing anything, nevertheless, as was becoming their ideas of their own importance, made quite a show of offended dignity. A Congress of Nations was demanded, and the demand was complied with. That Congress has been held and has proved, as everybody expected it would prove, simply a farce so far as restraining Russia is concerned. The San Francisco Chronicle of the present month has this paragraph touching the Eastern Question Congress. It is quite evident that as far as directing or controlling the action of the Muscovite government is concerned, the Congress is little better than a farce. England originated the idea of the Congress simply because it afforded her an opportunity of abandoning without actual dishonor a position she had assumed rather too hastily, and Russia was complacent enough to join in the little game, feeling satisfied that she would lose nothing by her courtesy. Turkey is the only aggrieved party in this dexterous arrangement. She is left face to face with her hereditary and implacable enemy for the nations that previously assisted her ostensibly through friendship and love of justice, but really through motives of self-interest, have evaded the challenge so openly flung into the arena by the northern colossus. It is easy to foresee the end of this conference. 
Russia will get all she requires. Another step will be taken toward the realization of Peter the Great's will, and the Sultan will receive a foretaste of his apparently inevitable doom, expulsion from Europe. <clears throat> Thus, all evidence <clears throat> goes to show that the Turk must soon leave Europe. Where will he then plant the tabernacles of his palace? In Jerusalem. That certainly is the most notable point. Newton on the Prophecies, page 318, says, Between the seas in the glorious holy mountain must denote, as we have shown, some part of the holy land. There the church shall encamp with, his, with all his power, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him, shall help him effectually or deliver him. Time will soon determine this matter, and it may be but a few months. But when this takes place, what follows? Events of the most momentous interest to all of the inhabitants of this world, as to the next chapter immediately shows. And that concludes Smith's article on Daniel 11. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? Okay, we have a comment in the chat. Dexterous. Ready and expert in the use of the body and limbs, skillful and active in manual employment, adroit as a dexterous hand, a dexterous workman. Second, ready in the use of mental faculties, prompt in the contrivance and management, expert quick at inventing expedients as a dexterous manager. Third, skillful, artful, done with dexterity as dexterous management. Ostensibly, an adverb, an appearance in a manner that is declared or pretended, an embargo and non-intercourse which totally defeat the interests they are ostensibly designed to promote. Okay, any other thoughts? Okay, well... This didn't happen. Yeah, it failed. Now, are we expecting this to happen? I would say no. Would would anyone expect this to happen? Could this even be reasonably have a part to play in end time prophecy? I can't see that it would. Now, as, as far as defining what a Turk is, I mean, if he defines a Turk as the Muslims, um. Now, when did when did um, Jerusalem get divided between the Catholics, the Muslims, and uh, um, what's divided? What's the other group? Uh, the Jews. When, when did it get divided? When was the city of Jerusalem divided? Anybody know? Was that at the time that Israel was made a state? I think it was divided just before then, but let's look. About 1948, apparently. Okay, so at the time they were made a state. So you're going to have... Figure something out here. Anyway, I don't think that we could see that as a fulfillment of what Uriah Smith is talking about. No. Now, of course, the big the big issue, because, you know, this is one of, of hermeneutics, is even though we take the idea that the first part of Daniel chapter 11 is is more direct prophecy than, let's say, Daniel 2 or Daniel 7 or Daniel 8. And it's more literal, right? But, yeah, um, yeah, we're studying the history. Oh, oh you bought the thermos. Go ahead. Just muted Kelly there. So, so it, you know, it's, it's more literal, but we would still have to have it move to spiritual once we get to the period after, uh, you know, once we get to the period of the papacy, we wouldn't we wouldn't continue doing things literally. Now, we, we've talked about this before, but why would we have to do that? Why would we have to look at these things spiritually rather than literally when we get? to the end of Daniel chapter 11, when we move to the papacy. What what are our reasons for that? We have a good reason, but what is it? Anybody want to comment on that? What's what's the reason? 
What's the main reasons that we've put forward to say that it, it has to be spiritual? Well, you got you got First Corinthians fifteen and forty six. It tells you you have to. Okay, well that and that's going to be deal, you know, which which is what first is earthy and then what is then spiritual, right? Now we we would say you know before the cross, literal after the cross, spiritual. That's right. But in this context of this prophecy, this is about the two indignations, right? This is about the twenty five twenty, and we have these we have this history of paganism and the history of papalism, the two desolating powers. So when we move from the taking away of the daily to the setting up of the abomination of desolation, we have a counterfeit of the week of Christ, correct? That's how we understand it. Okay, so this, so this counterfeit. And so then we would say, when we deal with the 1260, that we're looking at an application that is after the cross, right? Correct. It, it, it's, it makes the most sense. It's the most cohesive way to look at Daniel chapter 11, to understand it in the context of the 2520, and, and to see that what was first earthy, what was first literal, king of the north and the king of the south, now becomes typical. That is, it becomes spiritual. We have the counterfeit of the earthly and the counterfeit of the heavenly. The papacy is the counterfeit of Christ's heavenly ministry. And so we wouldn't apply these things to the literal nations. The other problem that we would have is in Revelation, uh, we don't apply literal Jerusalem as a part of Bible prophecy at the end of the world, right? Correct. We, we don't apply literal Babylon. We don't look at Iraq. We don't look at the names of the nations in in the book of Revelation and think that they have a part to play in Bible prophecy at the end of the world. And if we're going to do that with the book of Daniel, then we have a conflict between the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation rather than an agreement. Now, we also have another uh Question: Ellen White talks about the history in connection with this prophecy being repeated. Which 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 verses is she referring to there in Daniel chapter eleven? Do we remember what those verses are? Thirty to thirty-six. So thirty to thirty-six. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that that's that's correct, right? So when we look at those verses now. We can see that it's going to be talking, um, uh, and because and we had looked through this, and verse 34. Now, when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall, shall try them to purge them, to make them white to, to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And the king shall do according to his will. So when we look at those those verses, they're addressing the history of the time of the papacy, correct? Yes. Okay. So she says that those are going to be repeated. Are, who is going to repeat them? Is it going to be Turkey that repeats it? Or is it going to be the papacy that repeats it in connection with the United States? Papacy? Yeah. So it would be the papacy, right? So it, it would be so, uh, and, and then we can see that what we have as we, we move through these verses is a repetition of that history. When we get to verse 40b, we're going to see this history that, that happened with the papacy and Millerite history, that that history is going to be repeated in our history in connection with the Sunday law. And so there's a consistency there with that history being repeated, that it's a parallel uh, kingdom, so to speak. The modern Rome is going to be addressed there with the United States uh, connected with modern Rome. 
And that's what we see in Daniel or in Revelation 13. We see that connection to Daniel 11, verse 40, 40 B to 45, right? So there's, there's all this consistency in, in how we have come to understand these things. Now, is there anything else that we would have before we move to uh, David Thiel's paper that we would have to discuss here? Because we've already looked at Daniel chapter 12 in Uriah Smith's. So he's going to he's going to say, basically, these are events just that happened just before the close of probation. And, and they didn't happen. His prediction fails. So the history repeats in the sense that it fails. No, because his. <laughs> no, because I mean, he's just he's just totally misapplying these verses from verse 36 onward. Right. He's failing to take into account. So one is he starts with the idea that that this is an atheistic power that's going to be talked about in verse 36. It's going to be France. And there's no evidence that it's an atheistic power. The, the description is the same description as the man of sin in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. So that premise falls apart. Now, what we would have to do is try to understand why Ellen White supported Uriah Smith or at least appears to support Uriah Smith in regard to the Eastern question, because that's what people have thrown at me on social media, on Facebook. They try to take these statements of Ellen White supporting Uriah Smith doing presentations on the Eastern question. And when I look at those statements, I don't see them as an endorsement, right? She's just commenting on the fact that he's presenting on the Eastern question, and there's lots of interest in that. So, so we, we have to understand how do we take Ellen White's statements? And, and this is a problem that this movement faces because we know that she makes statements supporting, for instance, the 1843 charts or the 1843 chart and, and statements regarding the 1850 chart. And if we say, well, her endorse, endorsement doesn't mean anything, then why do we use her endorsement in some cases and not in others? And we need to know why we do that, because there's a difference between her endorsing, you know, the reading of an article or uh, the reading of a book compared to stating something very plainly about what's in a book or an article and being in agreement with it. Right. So, for instance, in um, Crozier's Daystar article. She doesn't just endorse the article. She she states what it is she endorses. What was that one that uh, might was it a word to the little flock or something? It was uh, like people were taking it as a full endorsement of what was written in some article, and so they they edited it later. And yeah, you're talking about the Daystar article. That was it. One. And what was the thing? The topic that they well, well, what they try to do is they try to get um, uh, Crozier to believe in the new view of the daily. So, you no, know, yeah. we did do an in-depth study on that previously, but um, so he's not really teaching the new view of the daily anyway. But but they try to make him doing that and saying that Ellen White's endorsing his new view of the daily, which means that she believed in the new view of the daily. And so it's a very complex, there's all of these sort of twistings that happen. And, and as Bible students, we need to be able to discern uh, truth from error. We need to be able to see when people are picking and choosing and using arguments uh, to prove something, but ignoring other evidence. Because we ourselves are not to do that. We have to be careful um, on how we we study and how we come to form our opinions and ideas. Well, on the 1843 chart, she says it it was directed by the hand of the Lord. Right? And the figures were as he wanted them. As he wanted them. Right. right. So, and Sam but, was over and he had a mistake in some of the figures, right? So there's very direct 
But, yeah. but I think this really but goes on. Smith's book, she says that it's just a helping hand. That's two different, that's two different, um, statements. But the one is, the one is she's directly in, endorsing it. And the other one, she's just saying it's a helping hand. Yeah. And, and definitely it was, right? Yeah. You know, you can't really deny that it was God's helping hand. It was. But that is that endorsing everything that's in there. Well, there's definitely lots of things that are wrong. Um, things that he misses and things that he gets wrong. So she's not saying it's an inspired book and we need to accept everything that he says in that book. Now, we also have Helen White's endorsement of Jones and Wagner. Right. So we have things that Ellen White endorses and people that Ellen White endorses. And we can't just pick and choose. Well, you know, in this case, we're going to accept her endorsement. And in this other case, we're not. So we have to be able to distinguish those things. But there becomes a bigger problem, which, which I think is at the root of all of the studies that we have done in this group is that we, we need to know how we come to understand the truth. And we need to recognize that the understanding of truth is not just an intellectual exercise, that this is a spiritual exercise, that to understand the truth is connected with our conversion process. That is, we cannot understand the truth if we are not converted by the truth. Correct? Don't know the truth, then the truth shall set you free. Yeah. God's word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It's it's a, a light that shineth more and more unto a perfect day. Right? There is there is a progress, a, pro, a, a progress and advancement of the Christian life as we accept light. As we have a lamp in our feet, the lamp doesn't shine all the way down the path. It gives light for our feet. And as we walk in that light, we walk further down the path. Then the light will shine further down the path because we're moving the lamp with us. That's God's word. And, and that's how it guides us. Amen. So, so we can't, I mean, we can deceive ourselves, right? If we depart from God, we, we can convince ourselves that we, that our perceptions of the world are true. You know, I've been studying a lot about um, mental illness lately and, um, and how we perceive the world and, and the differences that we all have. So as human beings, our perception of the world is faulty. Our perceptions of ourselves are faulty. Our perceptions of others are faulty. And, and this goes back to a dream I had, you know, a week or so ago that, that's still troubling me. Um, like, how do we know what is real? How do we know what is true? And how do we know? So how do we know what is true? Like when it comes to our perceptions, they're faulty. So how can we know what is true? Who knows what is true? Who's the only one that knows what is true? Well, that would be God. I know in my experience, uh, something there's something it rings true. It also lines up with past truth. Okay. Now, people can deceive themselves that something is true. People deceive themselves all the time. So we know that God knows what is true. He's the objective observer of all things, right? He, he's the only one who's objective because he knows all things. He, he, can, he can know what is true. Now, I'm subjective, and I can fool myself into believing I'm a good person. I can judge other people. I can, I can operate on cognitive bias and i have no way to get out of that except through a knowledge of god right because unless god shows me 
I find that God will also help us to have a knowledge of ourselves through a humbling process. Okay, so so when God shows us truth, you say there's a humbling process. What is, and He shows us our sins. That is, if God didn't show us our sins, well, maybe I put it this way: we can't know God. We can't come into contact without God with God without our sin being revealed to us. He that comes to Christ has his sins revealed. One of the ways we know things are true is they reveal things about us that are true that we don't want to see. Now, many people, and I'm, I'm saying maybe all of us, what we do is we end up believing things that actually make us feel better about ourselves. That's what conspiracy theories do. And, and also Bible truth can do that as well. People can come to believe things that are true in the Bible, but they believe those things to bolster their view of themselves. So, and, and, and it's hard to, it can be true things. They can be false things and true things, but there's something that set us apart from others that make us feel that we're better than others, that we compare ourselves with others instead of with God, Right. So those can be true things and they can be false things. Now, false things are usually more effective. True things usually are going to tend um, to show us our sin, but not always. Sometimes people will come to believe in true doctrines like the state of the dead or something like that. And they will use that as a way of seeing themselves as superior to other people who don't believe that way. But What's what's the power of error? Why is error even better than truth at showing us or, or deceiving us into believing that we're better than we are? What what's why is error better? I just think it. it I relate it right to the beginning when when Eve thought she was in an elevated state. She felt like she was enlightened when she ate the forbidden fruit. There's something there, but uh, yeah, that effect. Okay, well, and, and that that that's part of it. And, uh, um, so yeah, it does have uh, it, it's enervating, right? It, it it brings about excitement in a way that uh, is stimulating in some way. But but I think part of it has to do with the people who believe the truth, right? So by believing error, there are people who believe the truth and are affected by it and are changed by it. And those people are a condemnation to us, correct? That's right. Right. And so often we believe errors in contrast to those who believe the truth because it's a way of distancing ourselves from those who believe truth. As making, as trying to raise ourselves above them. So if you have somebody who's Christ-like, who believes the truth and is preaching the truth, and, and that person is in a sense condemning you by his godly life, then if you can attack something he believes, that can raise you above him so that you are not then, you don't then feel condemned by his holy life, or at least it's an attempt to not be feel condemned by his holy life, right? So if you can uh, attack a person by saying what he believes is error, even though he demonstrates a Christ-like character that condemns you. I've I've had this experience where you're sitting in church and the sermon's going on and it's like the preachers. How did you know that? You know, you feel like he's talking directly to you. Like he's talking about something that, that's going on in my life. It's like, he has no idea, but God directed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so this is, I mean, this is very fundamental. Like what we're discussing here, we're not just studying the book of Daniel and, and this is some intellectual exercise. And it's not, we're not doing this to prove like other people wrong and that we are right and that we are somehow better than other people. You know, we're not we're not standing in judgment of Uriah Smith and condemning him so that we can feel better about ourselves. Um, you know, and I do want to look at David H. Steele's paper. 
I'm actually going to bring it up here, Dwight, if you're done with this document. Here you go. Yeah, and thanks, thanks for doing all that work um, on those documents there, Dwight, putting those together. And uh, But I, I think at this point, you know, to look at this in a bit more detail is pretty important. Uh, I think you would agree here. Hopefully people agree. <clears throat> so this I got from um, Amazing Discoveries website. Now, Amazing Discoveries, that's, um, what's his name? The German guy or from South Africa, I guess he is. What's, what's his name? The word is, the word is lethargical. It's actually a word for having something on the tip of your tongue. You can't recall it. <laughs> okay. Um, what's the guy? Everybody knows his name. Walter yes. Weiss. Walter Weiss. Yeah. Okay. So Walter Weiss runs Amazing Discoveries. And, and, and they're sympathetic to a lot of our views. Um, we have this one pastor evangelist. Um, I can't think of his name either. I'm looking in the wrong box in my head for names. Uh, I'm, I'm looking in the panic box. The names are never. Uh, Victor. Uh, Victor Gill. Yeah. Sorry? Victor Gill. Victor Gill, yeah. Personal yeah. friends of ours. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I visited, visited him a couple of times, him and his wife. Uh, Heidi and I visited them back in, uh, I guess it would be, 2000 and uh, I'm trying to think when that was 2000. I don't know when that was 2017, I think. Yeah, it was 2017. Um, and had a good talk with him. And uh, I know his son Tim Gill through Facebook, but anyway, he 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 works with Amazing Discoveries and, and he's a very good pastor and he believes in the 2520. And 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 I I understand that Walter Weiss does as well, at least Miller's 2520. But, uh, you know, I've never fully understood exactly why um, Amazing Discoveries would support. But I guess, you know, there's just lots of people. They, they, they take your eyes, Ellen White statements regarding your eyes, Smith, as basically an endorsement. Right, so an endorsement of the book, and, and so that's what we're going to look at here. So um, I'm just going to read a little bit of this. We'll come back to this tomorrow because we only got about ten minutes. So from the time that Elder A. G. Daniels wrote his book about the reasons why the Great War sucked out so many nations into a terrible vortex, and projected what might be the outcomes at its conclusion. Many events transpired that appeared to raise barriers to the conceptualization that the Ottoman Empire, reduced to the boundaries of modern Turkey, could ever rise again to such a status as to threaten the establishment of a capital in Jerusalem. Okay, now, I'm not trying to criticize David Thiel here as a person, but this is a very poorly written sentence. Okay, so... Because I have no idea what he said. Does anybody understand what he just said? I stepped away for a few minutes. What was that? Okay. So we read from the time that Elder A.G. Daniels wrote his book about the reasons why the Great War, talking about the First World War, sucked so many nations into a terrible vortex and projected what might be the outcomes at its conclusion, Many events transpired that appeared to raise barriers to the conceptualization that the Ottoman Empire reduced to the boundaries of modern Turkey, could ever arise again to such a status as to threaten the establishment of a capital in Jerusalem. So, I mean, it's a poorly written sentence, especially as an introductory sentence to a paragraph or a paper. So, so we're, thrown, it, it, we're thrown in the middle of the ocean and asked to swim to shore with this paragraph. It, it's not really helping us too much or with this sentence. So by 1923, so we know the Ottoman Empire falls November 1st, 1922. So by 1923, Turkey had been secularized. The capital moved from Constantinople to Ankara. And Great Britain had a mandate to exercise civil authority over much of the Middle East, but particularly that of Palestine and specifically that of Jerusalem. 
Seventh-day Adventist Bible prophecy students, pastors, evangelists, and scholars mostly continued to toe the line, so to speak, on the Uriah Smith position regarding the Eastern question, even as Germany once more militarized its government and mobilized its population for the commencement of World War II, a terrible conflict that surpassed the horrors of the wars to end all wars. Still, during the 1920s and 1930s, some like Louis F. Weir became dissatisfied by the appearance of false conclusion and began to change their positions. By 1944, editors of the Review and Herald made the decision to continue publishing Smith's book, Daniel and Revelation, but with deletions that went beyond editing out any semi-Aryan leaning Smith held on the human nature of Christ to those historical paragraphs that had given such great weight to Smith's conclusions regarding the Eastern question. In so doing, the groundwork was laid for a multitude of interpretations on Daniel 11, with an emphasis on the identity of the King of the North being the papacy, and a variety of divergent identities of the King of the South, including Islam, atheism, communism, and others. By 1948, the British would leave Palestine, allowing Zionists to plant the Blue Star of David emblem on a white flag of the newly birthed nation, modern Israel. This is the historical backdrop to the book that Lewis F. Weir published in 1949 on the identity of the King of the North. So this is a very poorly written paragraph. And I hate to say that, I don't, but it is loaded with, with um, all kinds of colorings, right? That is, it's not a clear communication. It's, it's um, um, Eric Blair um, would have described this as propaganda. Now, you guys know who Eric Blair is, right? Don't oh the Blair Bill? No. <laughs> is, and uh, you asked about the when Teresa was the Prime alive. Minister of Canada. Eh? No, no, no. <laughs> British Prime Minister. Well, um, Justin Trudeau is the Prime Minister of Canada. Oh, and also you asked when Jerusalem was divided. It was in 1948 into East and West Jerusalem. Yeah. Okay. So. Eric Blair is known better. Uh, he's the author of a book called 1984, another book called Animal Farm. I remember the books. I didn't know that it was that name. Well, that's, that, that's not his pen name. That's his real name. Okay. Pen name being? Who wrote 1984? I'm trying to remember. George Orwell. That's George Orwell. It. <laughs> right. So... Uh, so Eric Blair wrote, uh, um, I can't remember the title of the, of the essay, but it's uh, dealing with language. And um, so this is highly emotionally charged, imagery, imagery driven language. It's also poorly written, and which is a typical characteristic of propaganda. So I would analyze this paragraph as propaganda. That is, he's not communicating clearly. He's setting you up um, emotionally to reject Lewis F. Weir's understanding. He's not clearly introducing this topic. And he's using lots of um, um, cliched language, right? Right? I mean, what, even things like the terrible was, conflict that surpassed the horrors of the war to end all wars. What's that? That was what? exactly the part of the, what I was going to say. <clears throat> That's emotionally charged. Yeah, and and cliches and this this sort of worn out phrases. Um, so it's not it's not written in a, in in a clear way. He's not really introducing his topic, uh, other than that he's introducing some some images and ideas that uh, basically Lewis F. Weir wrote this book in 1949 in this backdrop of uh, this reaction to the failure of, of Smith's understanding of events. And, um, and so it's just one of those errors that this, all these, uh, the groundwork was laid for a multitude of interpretations on Daniel 11, right? So he's going to, He's just going to throw this. It's another thing called muddying the water. 
where he just throws. There's lots of people who have all kinds of different interpretations on these things. Louis F. Weir is just another one of them, right? I would I would call it the quarterly. You call it what? I call it the quarterly. Seven day I've been this quarterly. Oh, it's like the quarterly. Yeah. Well, I think it's a little bit worse than the quarterly. Uh, you know, quarterly is written well. It's edited well. It's concise. This is not very concise. There's all kinds of extra words and sentences are not really cohesive sentences. It, it's poorly written. Now, now the I say the that quarterly <laughs> is the way the quarterly is similar is it changes things. That you, yeah. 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 Yeah, but I'm saying this is worse than the quarterly. In terms of literary style, yeah. Right, yeah. Now, now when I when I go on the internet and I I read, you know, an article. I mean, one of the things I look at is can this person write? Because if a person can write, it means that they have clear thinking. They could be wrong about what they're saying. But at least I know that if they can write, I can understand their ideas and I can decide yeah. whether they're correct or not. But when a person can't write, I don't bother reading what they write. It, um, what you're saying would be critical thinking skills? Was... Mm -hmm. Now, you know, and I've had some communication with David H. Steele. Again, I'm not trying to criticize the person. I'm not trying to, like, attack the man so that we can throw away his ideas. But I'm just saying that when we when we address an idea, we need to be able to have that presented clearly. And and it and it's sort of painful to go through and read something where the person themselves doesn't have clear thinking. Right? It's it's not it's not as enjoyable. I rather, you know, somebody who writes clearly and plainly, and then I can say, here's what he's saying. Here I'm you know, I'm having a hard time understanding exactly what he's saying. I I know that he's he's got a view and an opinion, um, but the way that he's he's supporting it isn't really the best way to do it. So it's not an attacking of the man. I'm not doing an ad hominem attack to dismiss it. I'm just saying it's going to make it a lot more difficult to understand his thinking. So I can I can see right away when I read something like this that it's going to be hard to know what he thinks because he himself is not clear on what he thinks. He doesn't know how to express it. Doesn't mean that he's wrong either because sometimes people, they can express right things, but they can't write. You know, they don't know, how, they, they can believe right things, but they don't know how to express right things. So they don't have clear language. But we can see here that there's a lot attached to it. And in my communication with him in Messenger, it was a very emotional uh, way that he writes. So I'm not great with emotional things, right? When people are emotional, I, you know, I'm not an emotional writer, emotional speaker. Um, I think about ideas. Um, emotions just kind of get in the way. We all have emotions. They're all useful things. There's not like emotions aren't bad. Uh, but when it comes to thinking, they can cloud our thinking. Right. So we need to be aware of them. So anyway, we're going to come back to this and start looking at this tomorrow, if that's OK. So, Dwight, you're you're done with uh, the Uriah Smith material, I guess. Right. That is correct. Yeah. So, OK. Well, do you want to close with prayer? Sure. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together and for the subjects that we were able to cover. We ask now, Father, for your guidance through this day, that you would instruct us and show us in all that we are to do so that we may more properly represent your character in all things that we are doing today. Be with us, we ask. Help us so that we may walk according to that that you would have us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.